Yeah, thank you for the invitation and I'm also very pleased to be here and speak a bit about my work in, in, in Africa, in Cameroon, in Nigeria and my cooperation with Harley Tufan and the Cornell University on the Next Generation Customer Freedom Project. Um, actually, I was a bit uh, surprised when I learned that Harley was here a couple of weeks ago and already talked about our collaboration so I had to quickly change my presentation and uh, just move the focus a bit from uh, uh, well talking about our collaboration only to a wider approach about uh, gender research in the CG system. I will nevertheless give some first results of um, the collaboration we have in, in, in Nigeria and I will also talk about qualitative approaches in general um, in gender research whereby I will highlight two qualitative case study approaches I was part of. One is the gender norms and agency study carried out uh, CG IIR white and the next kind of, uh, generation cassava breeding case study we do in Nigeria. Um, gender and research is still a very recent, not uh, recent uh, development and actually many of the approaches we are using now in the CG system were first introduced and developed by uh, in the co development context. So for example um, the paradigm of gender mainstreaming which is now pre uh, prevalent in all of the uh, consortium research projects I'm involved in uh, this gender mainstreaming approach was one result of the World Conference on Women in Beijing 1995 where um, a strong emphasis was put on gender and value chains and gender and assets to uh, achieve better income for uh, women and a better food security in the rural areas worldwide. Nevertheless, um, gender disaggregation in data collection and the reporting of gender disaggregated results was and still is quite un uncommon. And we have quite limited resources in a gender or sex disaggregated way. And also the claim of participatory approaches and the, participator and the benefits derived from this particip participatory approaches which was very inter uh, dominant in the 1990s um, is still uh, an add-on approach to ongoing research or uh, development activities. So there was always a gender team to do the gender work and it was never, never really uh, mainstreamed into the, the proper design of the projects. It was only recently that through donor pressure and uh, I listed a number of donors who insisted that gender components are really integrated into research and development activities like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the USAID or the EU. EU. This insistence on gender integration led to um, a change also in the CGIIR system and gender is now defined as a cross-cutting activity in all programs, in all CRPs, which are uh, consortium research programs. As a consequence, each of the CRPs had to develop a gender strategy, in, which includes components and strategies and uh, activities to mainstream gender and also to develop monitoring and evaluation con uh, concepts with a strong gender component because and that is the background of, of all this research was, was not any longer considered sufficient to deliver outputs I have trained 100 farmers I have to release 10 varieties but the consortium and the donors now consider what they call outcomes results I have imp we have improved the situation of 200 women in our action area for example. So it's a, it's a shift in from output oriented to outcome oriented um, research and well considering the difficulty to um, evaluate outcomes in a relatively short uh, time frame 
many products have. The CG system developed what they call IDOs or intermediate development outcomes. And what is interesting for uh, the gender work in the CG system is that one of the IDOs, there were 13, if I, if I uh, remember right, um, was the so-called gender IDO, which targets to increase women's control over resources and the participation in decision making and also considers a wider approach by adding or including other marginalized groups and uh, for some CRPs also the young, the youth, as a group to target the gender IDO. Um, as I said earlier, and in the, in the introduction, I am part of two of these CRPs. Um, that's the CRP on roots, tubers on, and, and bananas, abbreviated RTB. And I don't know who of you was part of the presentation Graham Thiele gave uh, earlier this year, who is the uh, focal point, the leader of this CRP. Um, and the second is um, the Humitropics program, which is a system CRP and has not totally, but really different approaches, different targets from the more commodity-oriented CRPs like the RTB. Uh, RTB is a, co um, a collaboration of four CG centers plus CIRAT, plus a number of local stakeholder and development partners. And important for my own work is the collaboration with the next generation cassava breeding project and the NRCRI in Nigeria, which is uh, the National Roots Crop Research Institute. So this kind of collaboration exists in different forms. And uh, the, the work on cassava trades I'm uh, talking about, or will talk about later, is uh, a collaboration with these two institutions, two uh, initiatives. The work in the Roots, Tubers and Bananas uh, CRP is organized around seven themes, leading from the improved access to genetic resources, to better varieties, better management of pests and diseases, the improvement of seed systems, to, uh, improved better cropping systems, including natural resources management, and better market access and post-harvest activities. The seventh theme is called the cross-cutting theme and uh, uh, well includes uh, capacity development and the gender research. So gender research is mainstreamed, is supposed to uh, be included in all the six themes I was uh, talking about. Um, the question is why we need gender research in the RTB program. And uh, one of the key reasons is that we have to react to gender differentiated roles, needs and opportunities. And especially for RTB crops, women are key players. They are the key producers. They are involved in post-harvest and processing activities and also play important role in the seed system of RTB crops, which is of course <laughs> much different from the seed system of the cereals and so on because you don't have the storage capabilities. They are all vegeta vegetatively propagated, etc. So these are the common uh, criteria of RTB crops. If we don't address gender inequity, we miss an opportunity to address growth and we also lose a lot of knowledge by women and men on uh, the crops we are looking at. And this local knowledge, I think, is a very important aspect of the gender norms and the next generation breeding uh, activities we carry out in Nigeria. A key, one of the other key elements we need to understand is the distribution of assets and benefits between men and women to uh, target the right groups, the right audiences in the right way. So it's not only about trades, about, uh, about understanding the demands and the opportunities,
but it's also to about developing the right technologies, adapt, adoptable, adapted technologies. As I said, we have uh, to integrate gender across the technical themes, this daisy, this pedal I showed. And one of the minimum requirements we define for our colleagues is to, call, to collect at least sex disaggregated data if doing any kind of baseline studies or, 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 or surveys in the uh, different domains. <coughs> they have to identify in, the, in their particular projects indicators for monitoring and evaluation and they have to in include a gender component in the monitoring uh, and evaluation because the consortium demands each project activity to report on gender activities as well. So this is why gender responsive research is so important and um, why it has to be included in all the six research themes. The minimum requirement except or in addition to collect sex disaggregated data is at least to try to do, new, to do no harm, to not worsen the situation of the target groups, the women you are, you are working with by introducing new technologies. In the end, we should try to strengthen the capacity to achieve transforma transformative gender outcomes because um, simply introducing a certain technology very often doesn't change anything. If we have to change and we have to think about how to change and how to influence the mindsets, the roles of women and men in society and the norms uh, uh, behind these this roles. And, uh, and responsibilities. And this is also why um, we, I will, and I will talk about this later, I participated in a consortium by gender norm study who exactly address this field of, um, of social, uh, social realities. The second program I'm part of is the Eumetropics. Uh, Integrated Systems for the Eumetropics, which is the full title. And by showing the partners, you already see that this is a much wider approach. We are partnering with a lot of CG centers, a lot of university partners, CIRAT, and so on, um, because we need all these capacities to, to um, look into the system uh, approach or to look into the system um, or to understand the systems we are looking in. Um, Different from RTB, which is a crop commodity-based uh, CRP and approach, the Eumetropics, like other system CRPs in the, consort in, in the CG network, it follows an area-based uh, uh, research approach. So we have uh, selected four action areas, two in Africa, and the two in Africa I put here on the map are this light green uh, ellipsis, we have uh, an action area in Central America and an action area in the greater Mekong region in Asia. These action areas are subdivided uh, into action sites, which are usually um, country uh, specific. And the action sites contain various field sites where the actual research is going on and where innovation platforms are um, established. So the major focus is not on a commodity. The major focus of systems research, in the case of Eumetropics, is on innovation and farmer participation in an innovation platforms. It's the capacity to innovate, which is our target. And also this capacity to innovate has to be considered sex or gender disaggregated. To coordinate the approach on an on a action site scale, we have established so-called R4D or research for development platforms who function as a coordinating body and below this um, innovation platforms where the actual research and interaction, the participatory work is going on. Um, different from Eumetropics, no not different, but uh, in, in, in Eumetropics we put a much stronger emphasis on the empowerment of women 
as one of our targets. We wanted to yeah, allow women to have better control uh, over the benefits from integrated uh, production systems and the research we are doing. By improved technology adoption by women producers, for example, by improved nutritional security and the proportion under, of income under women's control, because that has um, uh, a significant influence on nutrition and food security in general. By reducing the gender knowledge gap on farming system identification, this is a, a capacity development approach, which is very crucial uh, because research shows that there is usually a diff big divide between what women know and what men know, what extension or information services women can access and what men can access. And we wanted to improve uh, women's access to markets and services, which is linked to information, but not only, but also to, to, to knowledge and the, the opportunities and the options to, to assess this knowledge. While commodity research like the RTB uh, re research uses very often basic, uh, basic analytical framework like the Harvard framework or the Mother framework to analyze sex disaggregated data. So it's a relatively um, simple uh, matrix where we wanted to know about how sex disaggregated data could be analyzed and how the gender roles and responsibilities um, influence the access to resources and the control over resources. Gender targets in system research, like in Eumetropics, go beyond this basic, basic analytical frameworks. And frameworks, analytical frameworks, like the Women's Empowerment Framework of Longway or the Social Relation Approach from Naira Kabir play a big a larger or bigger, more important role in the analysis we are doing. As I said earlier, Eumetropics is targeting women's empowerment. And these are frameworks which can uh, assess women empowerment components and the focus on gender relation as relationships of power between men and women or dominant and underprivileged groups is one cr critical and important aspect of our analysis. Um, I will now present two qualitative uh, approaches to gender research. I'm an anthropologist, so I'm uh, used to qualitative work and real to long-term field work. This is not possible in the context of, uh, uh, well, research for development projects like what we are doing in the CG system. But at least we, we are trying to de develop some methodologies to use qualitative tools to access or to uh, investigate, to record data which are not structured, which are open. One approach, and actually both approaches, both methodologies are linked. Both use very similar tools. Uh, although the targets, the final targets, are, are different. One, the first one I'm going to present here is the Gender Norms and Agency Study, um, which is a global uh, comparative research study where 13 of the 15 CRPs contributed and which was developed and actually initiated by the uh, Consortium Gender Network. Last year, or the current year, almost 70 case studies were carried out using a very comprehensive, standardized, qualitative methodology. And more will come in 2015. Um, the aim is to cover as many CRP target regions, environment, and crops as possible, and to understand the, re the relationship between gender norms, agency, and innovation in agriculture and natural resources management. The objectives of the study are to overcome limitations of available location-specific data on gender norms in agriculture. And that is one of the large deficits of qualitative work, that it used to be very often fragmented, really case-oriented. And 
very different. The results were very difficult to compare on a larger scale. With this um, methodology, we wanted to improve our capacity to generalize and explorate our results or our qualitative results. So we wanted to identify broad patterns of change and constraints to change <coughs> and to provide robust empirical material and evidence on the relationship between the norms, the agency and agricultural innovations. Uh, what the data could be used for? Basically, for example, for priority setting, which is one of the uh, key elements in all of the CRPs, where to prioritize our limited capacities, what could be proper, probable targets for our research, and what interventions we are really uh, <coughs> we really should, should address. And last but not least, we uh, target to enable the CG system to achieve the gender and other IDOs, immediate, immediate development outcomes I was talking about earlier. The gender norm study is a very rigorous qualitative methodology it comprised of seven tools which were adapted from um, tools of an earlier or two earlier World Bank <coughs> studies carried out in more than 20 countries already and proved to be quite informative and successful. A part of the tools were focus group discussions with men, with women and with male and female youth, uh, an evaluation of social stratification because there are relatively rigorous um, instructions how to select the members of the focus groups. So we wanted to include different wealth categories, the poor, the, the better off, and so on. So it's a quite comprehensive, as I said, uh, methodology and, uh, and toolbox. We include individual interviews with men and women, and all in all, uh, 13 case studies have been carried out under RTB and five case studies from Eumetropics. These 18 studies are part of the 70 studies uh, globally carried out, I mentioned earlier. The, case, the two case studies I was part of were done in Nigeria and they very well complement actually the work I'm going to present next with the Next Generation Breeding Project. It was um, two were case studies in two of the action sites of Eumetropics uh, in Oshun and Oyo State. And this matrix here uh, is actually a, is a matrix to select villages. Because one of the, one of the in introductions we, we got from the developers of the study is to look into the differences in gender gaps, whether they were small and declining, high or rising, or uh, at the econo economic dynamism, dyna dynamism in, the two, in the different regions. Some words are really challenging. <laughs> so um, although the two villages we selected finally uh, belong to the same category of gender gaps, uh, high and rising, uh, they had considerable differences in the economic development status. So village two in Oyo State was yeah, more or less dormant, not a big development, while the village one in Ocean State was much more prosperous uh, comp today compared to 10 years ago. To get this information, um, we had uh, as a um, we, we, we carried out a, a, pre a preliminary scoping study th uh, th by reviewing literature and contacting actually uh, our partners in the action areas to identify the possible villages which we later uh, used for our study. <coughs> the benefits of the study for Eumetropics is manifold. I just selected four, no, five uh, key benefits uh, one is, for example, that the results of the study are also 
about all kinds of social realities, not only about gender. We look into social stratification in general, we look into access to assets by men and women and so on. Also, labor allocation plays a, uh, is, is, is one of the key elements of the research. And the perspective of young men and women, which are sometimes quite different from what are the perspectives of the elder, not, not elderly, but of the dominant uh, age in the villages. And of course, the knowledge of norms inform technology development and the prior prioritization of the innovation platform work in human tropics. There are some lessons learned, and these lessons learned also apply to the next generation uh, case studies we are doing. The manual had, needs to be adapted. We need to adapt the manual according to the location, has, be it through uh, translating it to local languages or to priority crops in the case of the more systems uh, approach in, as in human tropics. Um, the training takes time. That's also an important lesson learned because qualitative approaches are much more difficult to apply than the quantitative approaches where you have an enumerator with a standard questionnaire and he just has to tick yes and no. The numerators, the team has to understand the questions. They, they need to know or they need to want to know the answers, not just go through the list of, 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 of the questionnaires. This is something, it, it sounds, sounds obvious and easy, but if you, if you are in the field, it's a challenge sometimes. And as a consequence, the field team really matters. So it's, it's, it's a standardized approach, but if the field team doesn't understand it and follow the approach, the results are, are doubtful and, and difficult to use. So some lessons learned, and this is something which is, interested, is interesting for everybody who wants to carry out this more qualitative uh, field work is don't make the interviews too long, split up the questionnaire. Fatigue of the enumerator and the respondent is it's challenging. If you, ask, if you interview somebody for two hours, everybody's going to sleep. Um, some questions may work better than others, depending on the context. So if you have a list, you have to be flexible. Some, some questions don't, simply don't work in some context. You have to modify them. You have to be flexible to modify them, even on the spot. And what is the most interesting outcome? You can have very interesting narratives. And this is something also, well, in the first analysis, actually, we did with the team of the gender, uh, of, the, of the, Kasa, um, um, the next generation Kasava um, work, the team was removing all the nice quotes, which can show a lot of um, variability and really highlight how farmers think and how they prioritize uh, their, their, their selections. I have already talked a bit about the next generation Kasava study. That's the second approach. Um, a little bit similar to what we did in the, in the gender norm study, we use a variety of qualitative tools as a first step. Then, and this step is already carried out. We have already first results from this first step, which I will present later. The second step is an interdisciplinary survey at, the, at selected sub-sites at producer and processor level. And this is actually the most interesting and the most challenging um, part of our, our study on the next generation uh, breeding because here we have to bring together social scientists who are evaluating, recording, and trying to understand the local knowledge. And we have to bring together biophysical scientists like breeders, food scientists, who can translate what farmers say into a more scientific language and into a language which could be quantified, measured, and, re uh, and repeated. So this is a very challenging approach. We had already a first pre-pilot uh, carried out earlier this year. and. Uh, we well learned that we had to modify the approach and we now 
decided to, to do this interdisciplinary survey on a smaller scale, not on all the, the villages we, 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 uh, we, we, um, <coughs> where we do the first social s science survey, but to use a smaller sample and include really measurements, maybe some um, um, work on the genomics to identify varieties by genomic analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And the third step is the step of tool improvement and standardization of the methods. And this is uh, thought as a participatory uh, uh, process where we will go back to the farms, discuss our results of the comparison of the linkage with farmers and also with scientists to see if the translation is correct, if uh, the, the results and the deductions are correct. Um, as I said, the case studies itself, and that is the part we already carried out, use a variety of qualitative tools, reaching from structured questionnaires to focus group guidelines and individual interview questionnaires, all serving various functions. I don't go to the details, just to show some uh, of the more uh, of the more uh, structured questionnaires, like uh, a questionnaire we used for a community profile um, as a part of a scoping study. So we ask, for example, background village backgrounds, what social groups, and the list should go down here, exist in the village, what the share of the population. So to get some background of about the population in the village, we are targeting, or we probably will target. We ask some questions about yeah, the economic, labor, agriculture, and natural resources information, where cassava production information is a part of what changed over the last 10 years. Are the differences between how local male and female producers have been affected by these changes or different leading, what are the different agricultural products? These are just some questions, it's, it jumps from one to 13 uh, out of a longer list of, of relatively structured questions. And we have questions on services, information access, so how women, how men access information, uh, how many people have cell phones, how many people are linked to the internet or to other means of, of communication and information. Um, the second component, the focus group discussion, uh, is based also on guides where we look into general community information, livelihood activities, poverty indicators, etc. And B, the most important part for our study, the preferred cassava traits and the varieties and characteristics of cassava grown in the different villages. So what cassava varieties do farmer grow, the proportion of cassava grown of each variety, into cropping, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a long list of different uh, agronomic practices people perform. We look into the cassava seed systems, cassava production, decision-making and production, processing, marketing, decision-making and processing, and changes in cassava production. So it's a, it's a very long list of, uh, of, of, this, of, of uh, questions, not a very long list, but uh, a quite considerable list of, of, of questions we have to cover uh, the information we, we need to identify in the end cassava traits. And this is done uh, with men and women separate, with young men and young women. So we uh, adopted a bit the same approach as with the gender norm studies I presented earlier. Um, I, don't, I will not go really into, into the details of how this questions uh, questions look like this is an uh, as, a, as a third component we have a more structured uh, questionnaire which is which we ask to individuals and not to household heads that's actually also an important an important um, yeah criteria if you do gender work really to 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 get away a bit from targeting only households and household heads but asking women and men from the same household the same question sometimes. And we do it in the Kassava, a next generation Kassava study 
uh, in uh, two different sections. One is more structured, with, uh, where you can really tick information, and the second part of the questionnaire is a more open question, uh, open type of guideline questionnaire, where we wanted to to get more open information on the f the household level, but asking men and women separately. It's about decision making, prioritization, for example, where we use more open ended questions. Um, yeah, the interdisciplinary surveys I was talk uh, was talking about earlier. Uh, this is in addition to the social uh, science studies and uh, the teams will include breeders, food technologists, agronomists and so on. All parts or qualifications, all scientists, we need to identify uh, the characteristics. And the third, the tool improvement where we, uh, will part well, or where we wanted to phenotype for key quality traits uh, and where we want to head for further development and testing of ontology terms based on the feedback from biophysical scientists and also farmers I should have added. Um, some of the results and this is already the last section of my presentation um, from a first analysis of two villages we did uh, this is not representative, as most of the results are not representative, but they sh shed already some light on how people, women and men, conceptualize the traits and what is their role and engagement in cassava cultivation. So, for example, in village A, farmers cultivate uh, the average of four varieties. The most uh, Popular variety is a local variety, Dangaria and IIT, that's, that's how they call an improved variety. We couldn't yet identify the variety. That is actually one of the challenges. So people give names to improved varieties, but which IITA variety is it? 419, ABC? We have, to, we, have to find, we have to get there with experts who know the varieties and maybe even do some, some uh, yeah, genetic uh, verification because some of the varieties are really not easy to, to, to identify. These are just some uh, of the results of the ranking of cassava. So women, men and young women ranked dang, uh, Dangaria at the first variety. Only the young men interestingly ranked IITA first because it's an early maturing high yielding uh, variety which has some other uh, uh, agronomic characteristics which are interesting for the young men in particular. Um, well, to the right, it's a list of the varieties grown in the villages, but only four were really uh, con cultivated in a, in a considerable amount or on, on a considerable surface area. As I said, uh, all the gender groups ranked Dangaria as the first variety. Um, from the focus group discussion and the interviews, um, we revealed that the traits are similar, but nevertheless, uh, if you look into these diagrams, you clearly see that depending on the variety, ma oops, ah, okay, <laughs> men and women um, prioritize different traits differently, and it's interestingly the high yielding which was prioritized by women more than men uh, at the local variety. So it's not always through what is, which is one of the uh, yeah, standards that men go for high yield, women go for cookability, for example. That could be, it could be, it could be different. Although, for example, women also ranked fast cooking as a, and fast maturing as an important trait at the local variety. Well, the high yielding quality of the improved variety was especially uh, considered by men and I think the young man played uh, an, uh, an important role why this IITA variety 
was ranked high. <coughs> but also other, other um, traits like labor requirement and so on uh, revealed interesting, interesting results. So these are results based or results from one village and um, a few interviews. So looking into, a, fully analyzing the data we already have might, might, might produce some modified results and give a bit more um, yeah, leverage to prioritize. But still, we, we, even with a relatively small example of questions, we can see quite interesting prioritization and trade preferences between men and women. Um, the gender groups also have different um, opportunities to learn new things. Uh, interesting but not unexpected is that men got information from agricultural extension, other farmers and over the media, while women got most of the information from other farmers, so 50%. But um, it also depends on, um, on yeah, the education level of men and women, but this is something which we didn't yet uh, include in our an analysis. But also the sources of planting material show quite interesting results. Um, men have more access to research stations. So women, for example, hardly can access research stations. That means a material from uh, IIT, for example. But basically, um, basically rely on the own farm and other farmers. So extension and especially the high quality material from research stations is basically used by men. Um, quality traits are not the only um, traits interested and prioritized if it comes to development and inc in, in increased income or food security. Very often it's, uh, yeah, tr constraints with our outside the domain of agricultural research which worry people most, like the bad uh, road network, the lack of money, and the climate uh, variability. So planting material, uh, agricultural extension only is one component of, um, of the whole setting of constraints and the whole opportunities and challenges to increase agricultural production. This is something also we have to keep in mind, as a, especially as a uh, research institute focusing on breeding, on, on dissemination of varieties and so on, and agricultural uh, resources management. So there are other factors which we can't really um, address with our research and, and extension which worry people sometimes most. And I, can know, I know from innovation platform meetings we had in the Humitropics context that a similar ranking like what we found here in Nigeria came out in Cameroon as well, for example. So roads are always an issue, infrastructure, lack of money, whatever this means. It's credit, but it's also loans. It's uh, free money from sales of products, etc. So I'm uh, almost at the end. Just a few conclusions. To understand gendered trade preferences, we need a multidisciplinary approach. In the next gen program, we are practicing this multidisciplinary approach. We have to combine biophysical and social scientists in the work on the fields, not only in the analysis. Qualitative social science research can produce traits information not thought of by breeders. This, this, open, uh, this open question or open type of questions can really produce new ideas. Everybody now talks about poundability, but in, from a study in, in Malawi, for example, we had a, on, on, on orange-fleshed sweet potatoes, we, have, we got a very interesting result that women prefer 
broad leaves instead of the smaller leaves because they're easier to cook, for example. That was something, the leaf form was not, uh, on sweet potatoes was something nobody thought of as one criteria for, for ranking a sweet potato variety rather high. So this new trade uh, could be interesting, but they could be also, of course, challenging for breeders because you can't breed for everything. So this is, of course, um, a discussion we need to have about how to balance this different information levels and different information details. And I'm already with, at my next conclusion. It's not easy to give simple, or not possible even, to give simple recommendations. And our results are not statistically representative. And that is something which worries a lot of colleagues. How to, how to find a way to get from pointed information very detailed information to some kinds of recommendation which could really influence breeding. I think this is the ongoing discussion I will have with Harley and other breeders in the program as, uh, over the next weeks and months when more results, more detailed results come in. Um, yeah, it's not only about traits, it's not only about the planting material, it's uh, also about issues like access to assets and control over income, own income by women, which uh, could improve the situation, the income, the food security, the nutrition of uh, families in our target areas. And we have to be aware that also social benefits are worth considering, and not only economic benefits. So we have to cover, to, to to, to look into the whole system, the social system, the economic system, and the agricultural system. Okay, that's so far. Thanks a lot for listening.